Greetings. I'd like to welcome you all to an interview with Spencer Nilsson, President and Creative Director of Expression College for Digital Arts. This is Alexander Brandon. I'm conducting this interview because Spencer has created some of the most well-known soundtracks of all time, from Echo the Dolphin to Sonic CD. Spencer's career includes more than game music, however. He has experience with record production, as well as film and television work. In this exclusive interview, we get a unique perspective from someone who has dabbled in all areas of music media. Spencer, great to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Well, I'll start with you at age 14. You worked with San Francisco groups working in studios. Talk a little bit about that phase of your life and what got you from there to working with bands like U2 and Aerosmith. Great. Yeah, I, uh, I started off playing piano and I noticed one of your questions is about the trumpet. Um, don't play trumpet. Uh, but I, I'm a pianist, a vocalist, I play a little bit of guitar and bass, but mostly keyboards and piano are my, are my main instrument. I started playing when I was about five years old. Uh, my father had, was an architect and he had taken a, taken a job and the client had given him uh, a pre-1900s uh, upright piano that he put in our living room and it became my toy box. From the time I was about five, I would play every day. I would stick things in the strings. I would, you know, I, I basically could do anything I wanted with this piano. And um, it wasn't a, a nice piano by any stretch of the imagination, but I was fascinated with all the me mechanics of it and the sounds that I could get out of it. So I began to play and um, I, I'm, I'd say 95% self-taught. Um, I did do a short stint of lessons uh, somewhere in my, uh, you know, uh, junior high and high school years, but I was far too advanced as a player to really have the patience for the teaching. So I'm self-taught, and I, uh, so I, I was playing a lot in, um, you know, just writing my own music and, and very much um, involved and engrossed in, in the piano. And I started to hang out at a, at a music store in San Francisco at the time called Don Weir's Music City. And this is the mid 70s, so the music business in the Bay Area was booming. And we had acts, you know, the, the whole gamut of acts from Carlos Santana and, you know, Jefferson Starship and, and uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on, Journey. Um, and these, all these people would shop at this particular music store because it was probably the most professional of any of the music stores in the Bay Area at the time. And I was just so enamored with keyboard instruments of all kinds at that point, whether it was organs or pianos or, and at that point synthesizers were coming out. So I, I started hanging out at the store and just dabbling in synthesis. Um, and the guy who ran the, the keyboard department, and his name escapes me now, but he was very tolerant <laughs> of this kid. and. Uh, and he allowed me, as long as I wasn't being disruptive, to play, because I was a pretty good player, I was making decent sound on these things. And eventually he had me start to demonstrate some of these instruments for uh, the artists who would come in because I understood them more than he did at the point, at that point. So that led to some early session work. And I was early in my teens, 13, 14 years old, so my mom was my roadie for those first couple of uh, sessions and and uh, you know would get me to and from studios like the plant studios where you know rumors by Fleetwood Mac was recorded and all the early stuff by uh, Santana and Metallica and a lot of the Bay Area bands um, so I st first time I walked into the plant studios it changed my life I had never been in a large expensive you know state-of-the-art at the time recording studio and I just felt totally at home I it just felt like this is where I want to spend my time and so from that point forward um, it's clear in my mind it was it was all about recording and composing more so than live playing I did more live playing after my first record came out on on uh, American gramophone and I did uh, you know a short stint of touring but studio recording writing producing has been my life since then so god I hate to say it but it's been almost 35 years that I, I'm 48 now, so it's it's been fully my entire adult life and even a little bit before that. Um, I feel like I have just enough knowledge to be credible, but I'm still a sponge, you know, and working with a thousand very creative, um, energetic students every day, um, you know, is, is, a, is a godsend for an artist, I think, just to have that, that energy. But anyway, yeah, that's how I, how I got started in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, I actually at that point was working in a piano store in Marin County 
and uh, it was a great job. I was I was working during the day, you know, vacuuming floors and delivering pianos and just kind of the all around go to guy. And then at night, I would work as a salesperson and selling these gorgeous, you know, nine foot Steinways and Baldwin pianos and playing my butt off. And uh, and I got to start working with artists then, um, which got me started into the whole concert uh, arena. And then I went to San Diego State College uh, out of high school and immediately needed a job because I was putting myself through college. So I got a job on campus as the concert promoter. And it was at San Diego State, there's almost 35,000 students. It's like a small town. Um, there were three great music venues from a 4,000 seat uh, amphitheater down to a 300 person punk club in the basement of you know, the main uh, student building. And so I got to book concerts and, and work with bands. Um, I mean, in this small club, we booked everything from the Ramones and the Clash, you know, some of the early punk stuff that was going on in the late 70s, early 80s, um, all the way through the Art Ensemble of Chicago and, and the Pat Metheny group and, you know, just a fantastic range of, of artists. And uh, so I just kept plugging through college, doing that, writing music. At that time, I, uh, I wrote my first piece for television, uh, which was for a PBS special called Making Special Friends about the integration of handicapped children into public schools and actually got my first Emmy nomination uh, when I was 18 and, uh, and still in college. So that was a lot of fun and, and again, just a great learning time for me. That's definitely getting started, hitting the ground running, so to speak. Well, that was, yeah, that, you know, in college is where I was really introduced to the, the granular uh, side of, uh, of synthesis. The stuff I was doing in the music store was all, you know, preset synthesizers with a few knobs on the top. And when I got to San Diego State, the electronic music program run by Terry Setter, who's a well-known electronic music uh, creator, producer, and writer, um, were these, you know, Buchla and Moog synthesizers that were, you know, 10 feet high and and you know, 14 feet wide, and you had cables everywhere, and plugging filters into modulators into you know little controller surfaces that weren't keyboards at the time. And so I really started to dig down deeper into music concrete and and the the more raw side of of electronic music. And uh, then was introduced to Wendy Carlos and uh, and Tomita and people like that, which just blew my mind. I mean, when, the, when I heard what they were able to do. Uh, game over. <laughs> I was I was sold. Switched on Bach, right? Yeah, switched on Bach and uh, Tomita's uh, Snowflakes Are Dancing, which is his 1969 recording of Debussy music that's just phenomenal if you've never heard it. No, I can't say that I have. Oh, you, you'd be blown away. Yeah. 